Uganda, the Pearl of Africa, a landlocked gem full of spectacular wildlife and wilderness. But even in paradise, there are perils among the chimpanzees who will care for a little orphan. And can a lioness wounded by a poacher's snare survive to care for her cubs? Some animals here face challenges that require human help, like these rare giraffes who need a new home. We have uh, two male giraffes and uh, four females. Together, they're on the road to success in wild Uganda. Towering mountains, volcanic craters, and colossal Lake Victoria, the source of the Nile River. From space, it's easy to locate Uganda. In East Africa, it lies between Lake Victoria in the southeast and the mountains of the Rift Valley in the west. Uganda boasts a natural treasure trove of national parks. Its most famous is Bwindi Impenetrable Forest in the southwestern part of the country. Bwindi used to be a forest reserve where people could go in and cut timber, but it became a national park in 1992 to protect the gorillas and the other wildlife in the park, which includes elephants, chimpanzees, and other species. Conservationist Gladys Kalima Zikosoka is leading the effort to save Uganda's critically endangered mountain gorillas in parks like Bowindi. This park is small, just over 310 square kilometers, yet it has some impressive inhabitants. Like this adult male mountain gorilla named Mukiza. Wind Impenetrable National Park is home to just under half of the world's endangered mountain gorillas, a minimum of 459 gorillas, and we're really pleased that the numbers are continuing to grow. Mukiza is the head of a group of 10 gorillas, six adult females, one sub-adult male, two young females, and two babies. Tweaky gave birth two months ago. The group's attention is focused on her new baby, Ni Kubara. Mountain gorillas are so similar to us. We share over 98% genetic material. And clearly, a mother's love for her baby is part of our joint inheritance. Ni Kubara will depend on her mother until she's six years old. Tweaky and her baby are members of the Kia Gorillo group. Scientists know their history well. They've studied them for over 20 years. This fairy tale valley is such a popular gorilla eatery that it's attracted another group, the Bitakura. led by a huge silverback called Magisha. Silverbacks can eat more than 30 kilos of vegetation a day. 
Even the smaller females eat more than 18 kilos. The group spends up to six hours a day just chowing down. Life is peaceful and conflicts with neighboring guerrilla groups are rare, even though their home ranges may overlap. Magisha is a gentle giant and often spends hours playing with the youngsters in his group. Researchers believe Magisha is 18 years old, a mature adult. The baby gorillas are very curious, just like human babies. And when they are born in a group, they tend to be very close-knit. They tend to groom each other a lot and the babies of the different females play together and they learn a lot from each other. Gorillas can spend half the day relaxing once they get over their youthful curiosity. Gorillas are very sociable animals. They live in a harem with a father and many females and many babies. And the mothers are very good mothers. There are 13 gorillas in the Bidakuru group. This young male is known as Naguru. He's two years old. Rukumu is the group elder. He's likely in his early 30s and was presumably once the dominant silverback. These days, he lives peacefully on the periphery of the group, enjoying a guerrilla version of retirement. Like a tolerant grandpa, he lets a young female climb aboard and gives her a gentle lesson in chess beating. She learns quickly, even though chess beating is normally a male behavior. As in a human family, gorillas of all ages interact, cuddle, and play. Mountain gorillas have an enviable lifestyle. Long naps, followed by big feasts, followed by long naps. It's pretty much what all gorillas do. But when it comes to food, gorilla groups have different styles. But windy gorillas prefer a rooftop restaurant climbing trees in search of a bite to eat. The gorillas mainly like to eat leaves, shoots, and stems, but because Bwindi Penetroba National Park has very many tall trees, they also eat quite a lot of fruit. The entire group may scramble up as high as 30 meters to feast on ripe fruit in the treetops. Although the young gorillas are fairly clumsy, they still climb the tall trees and eat fruit right off the branches. It's risky business for babies still honing their climbing skills. And adults whose 160 kilograms test the smaller branches. but the payoff is worth it. The fruit is much more nutritious than the usual diet of leaves. Gorillas here once faced far greater dangers than hazardous climbs. In the 1980s, poaching almost led to the extinction of these primates. They survived thanks to sanctuaries like Buindi. Uganda's natural riches stretch from the mountain forests down to the shores of Africa's largest lake, Lake Victoria. 
Tanzania and Kenya share this water source. But almost half lies in Uganda. The White Nile springs to life from the northwest end of the lake as a wild, tumultuous stream. Despite the construction of power stations and dams, the river remains a true force of nature. The Nile flows over plains and down rapids until it thunders over the edge of Murchison Falls. In fact, there are two waterfalls here, Uhuru and Murchison. Murchison Falls National Park is Uganda's largest conservation area. It's home to an endangered subspecies of giraffe called the Rothschild's giraffe. In Uganda, we have over 1,200 giraffes. And actually, the last stronghold of the Rothschild giraffe is Murchison Falls National Park, which is amazing. They can grow more than five and a half meters in height, making them some of the world's tallest. Their coloring is unique, too, with dark brown and orange patches on their bodies, while their lower legs have no markings at all. These gentle giants face threats from illegal hunting, human population growth, and oil and gas exploration. But conservationists have come up with a way to whisk them out of danger. Since the human activities are mainly on the north side of the Nile, Operation Twiga, Swahili for giraffe, has been translocating them to the safer south side. But that is no easy feat. Remove, remove, remove. In Uganda's magnificent Murchison Falls National Park, wildlife experts are holding their breaths as they prepare to translocate six giraffes. For now, the animals are in a boma, or corral, waiting to be loaded onto a truck. This one sports a GPS headset to track her movements after release, so park rangers can be sure she's safe. Loading them onto the truck is tricky business. There's a little jockeying for position, but they gradually all settle in. A ranger secures the tailgate under the watchful eyes of a giraffe who's become everyone's favorite for his easygoing personality. His fans include two giraffe experts from Michigan State University who are helping with the operation. So he's the one facing the other side, that one? Yeah, 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 yeah. He's the, he's the, yes. The shortest guy. He's the one nicknamed uh, Melman because he looks like the giraffe in uh, Penguins from Madagascar. Melman, another man and four females set out in a truck stocked with acacia branches for snacking on the go. Trucking giraffes is not without its perils. If one should fall and get trampled, it could meet a tragic end, but it's still the best way for them to travel. You can't travel with giraffes when they're lying flat. They can't spend a lot of time lying down because of the pressure in their body and their long neck. They're very, very fragile. It'll be a bumpy 17-hour journey to their new home. This is very exciting. The loading went well, and all the giraffes are now in the carts. Everything went smoothly. Once you get the giraffe in a truck, and they're with their fellow giraffe, they relax and they settle down. The giraffes head to their new stomping grounds across the Nile River. Once they arrive, they'll get a glimpse of some of their new neighbors. Several thousand hippos live in the park, 
They can weigh almost three metric tons, and they aggressively defend their young against any potential threat. In the middle of the last century, there were millions of hippos in Africa. Now, under increasing threat, Murchison Falls National Park is a vitally important sanctuary. Here, hippo numbers are gradually increasing. At midday, thirsty elephants arrive on the banks of the Nile. The hippos obviously don't appreciate the other pachyderms pushing in and look for a quieter spot. To the south, but also along Uganda's western border, is Queen Elizabeth National Park. It's one of Africa's oldest nature reserves and the most popular park in Uganda for both tourists and wildlife. It has the greatest diversity in any of Uganda's parks. This park features a rich mix of lakes, rivers, forests, and plains. The Ishasha River forms the border with the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So you could say these hippos are the border guards. Bull elephants sometimes gather in the forests and savanna alongside the Ishasha. Some may be 40 or even 50 years old, a good sign for the health of the park's herds. Elephant bulls were once thought to be solitary, but scientists now believe they sometimes band together. And in these bachelor herds, the old boys spend their time shooting the bull about the locals. The equator is just a few kilometers away, and frequent tropical rains keep the landscape a lush green, providing excellent grazing for thousands of animals. The grasslands of this park are home to huge herds of buffalo. The intense midday heat drives them to water holes. The buffalo are only outnumbered by Uganda cob. Females and their young roam the plains together in large groups. Males tend to lead solitary lives, but not during mating season. Each buck defends a small patch of grass in order to impress and hopefully attract females. They strut their stuff with fancy footwork. The occasional mock fight adds to the spectacle. There are tens of thousands of Uganda cob in the park. Right now, it's full of baby animals making their first unsteady steps. Young and naive, they're likely victims of armies of relentless hunters. Especially when evening falls and spotted hyenas hunt. Tonight, they've made a kill. In the half-light, the hyenas devour their meal. Hyenas crunch and eat even the bones of their prey. Antelope watch, but keep their distance from the hyenas. This buck provides a hearty dinner. For now, his sacrifice will keep his herd mate safe. 
but they watch warily as the hyena is joined by white-backed vultures. <laughs> the vultures keep well away from the hyena's powerful jaws. He tries to hide the body in the bushes. The vultures just wait. They know the hyena will eventually give up. Like hyenas, lions hunt at night after spending the day resting and sleeping. This tired lion has chosen a candelabra tree for an afternoon nap. The lions of Uganda are among the few lions in the world who spend much of their lives in trees. And scientists don't know why. Is it simply a behavior that's been passed down for generations? Does this lioness just feel safe on her high perch? Or do the tree climbing lions enjoy a better view of their prey? The antelope are nervous. They must know they're being watched. But this older lioness, named Brenda by park rangers, has herself almost fallen prey to the deadliest predator of all. It would seem lions would be the apex predators in Queen Elizabeth National Park in Uganda. But it's the wire snares of illegal human hunters that are the cruelest killers. Rangers collect thousands each year, but they can't keep up with a practice rampant in parks across Africa. Lioness Brenda was caught in a snare around her neck when rangers spotted her just in time and freed her. She still bears the scar, but she escaped with her life. Every day, rangers find animals caught in these snares. To free them, they have to immobilize them so the animals don't panic. The snares are designed to tighten as an animal struggles to escape. A very few get help in time, like this lucky young antelope. A win-win for her and the rangers. <laughs> the snares are intended to capture antelope for the illegal bushmeat trade. But lions who follow the game trails are often accidental victims. Like Butcher Man, a snare cost him his left hind leg. Yet this big-hearted lion still remained king of his pride for three years and sired many cubs. Because of poaching and habitat loss, there are now only half as many lions in Africa as there were 25 years ago when the Lion King premiered in theaters. One creative solution is a community-based conservation effort called Snares to Wares. Local men and boys who once might have poached to make a living instead become artisans. They repurpose the snares to create sculptures of native wildlife. They sell their work around the world and even exhibit it at museums like this tribute to Butcher Man and his cubs on display at the Detroit Zoo. And a life-size giraffe at Michigan State University, which sponsors the program. The exhibitions shed light on the snaring problem and celebrate the beauty of Uganda's wildlife. The six giraffes being translocated across the Nile River in Murchison Falls National Park are still on the road. Now we have about uh, 23, 24 kilometers to get to the ferry, and then you can cross over and release them. 
The giraffe's carrier is traveling at just 16 kilometers per hour to avoid upsetting them. The most dangerous part would, if the truck went too fast or if we came across a bad patch of the road, and that would be very bad because that's how you get giraffes falling and we wouldn't want that happening. It makes for a long, careful journey across the savanna. We have people on the truck watching them in case of anything. So uh, everything looks good, good progress. But Melman and his buddies still have miles to go before they reach their new home. <laughs> to the south, in Queen Elizabeth National Park, elephants gather wherever trees and bushes provide food. For decades, they suffered at the guns of poachers. But that's changing. We're really pleased that the elephant population in Uganda has really grown. In the 1980s, it decimated almost to zero, and now the numbers have gone up to 5,000, about 600%. And this is due to more protection efforts, more law enforcement, and more community conservation efforts in the parks where the elephants are found. The herd is led by a dominant elephant matriarch. She and her female relatives all care for the young. The young bulls in the herd are not as nurturing, to say the least. Instead of helping, they prefer to mess around, and they start from a young age. As the males grow older, the games become more serious. The tussles are no longer just youthful exuberance. The bulls have to sort out who's in charge. Other animals nearby are just as social, but they're much smaller, and they live in dens. They also have some very unlikely friends. Banded mongoose. They may look like rodents, but they're actually in the same family as civet cats and meerkats. Their day begins with communal cleaning to maintain hygiene and strengthen the bonds between the animals. Scientists have spent two decades studying the social behavior of these banded mongooses and they have a lot of quirks. For instance, mongooses living in the same group all give birth on the same day. This morning, once clean, the group of mongooses, which can be called a mob, pack, gang, or troop, heads out to find something to eat. But they're not the only ones looking for breakfast. These monitor lizards can enter mongoose burrows. Could he be hunting a baby mongoose for his morning meal? These fast, fierce reptiles are among the most intelligent of all lizards and can actually learn to count. This guy's counting on a baby mongoose for breakfast. But his chances of getting a meal on the go have gone from one to none. He loses his appetite when he sees all the protective adults. Some species of mongoose are bold enough to attack venomous snakes, like cobras. So this dude is no problem for them. Recently, 
scientists observed another unusual mongoose behavior. The groups living in Queen Elizabeth National Park developed a special relationship with warthogs. The warthogs keep still while the mongooses check their skin and hair for parasites to eat. So everybody's happy. This kind of grooming is fairly common in nature. But between two species of non-primate mammals, this is a first. In the ancient forests of Mount Elgin, a Sykes monkey has to do his own grooming. Nearby, elephant tracks pockmark the slopes. Mount Elgin is the oldest extinct volcano in East Africa, at least 24 million years old. The tracks lead to a cave entrance. There are strange markings on the wall, deep scratches that in places reach up to the roof of the cave. Even further inside the cave lies a disturbing sight the skull of an elephant. How did the elephant end up here and why? Poaching can be a threat in this area. Did an illegal hunter bring down this giant? But now, there's trouble elsewhere in paradise. There's a problem with the giraffes at a rest stop on their journey. We need to pull from there. As long as the vehicle is moving, the giraffe will settle down and they won't have so many issues. When the vehicle stops, they'll start kicking the truck and they'll start getting impatient. Do you have an animal down? One of the giraffes has fallen down and it's Melman. Get it, get it, just pull it from the other end. This could be a disaster. Melman the giraffe struggles to stand up. If the others panic and he gets caught in a tangle of legs, he could be trampled. Arthur helps with the rescue. Okay, that's good, it's not completely down. Six. Six are up. And that means Melman is back on his feet. Oh. Good, thank you, Fatilo. Arthur returns to his car as the caravan gets back on the road. We're doing good. Uh, one giraffe fell down, but now it's back up. Okay. Standing up, nothing, nothing serious, it seems. Melman and his tower, the term for a group of giraffes, are safely on the road again and their fan club grows as they pass some school children who've come out to watch the spectacle. It's a lesson in conservation in real time. In Queen Elizabeth National Park, in the late afternoon, the female elephants and their young move through the dense scrub to the cave. They're cautious since they've had several run-ins with poachers but it seems they're on a mission. As twilight turns to night, it takes infrared cameras to see them in the dark. In the forest, close to the entrance of the cave, an elephant rumbles.
At the cave entrance, it becomes clear that at least a dozen elephants have made the journey here. They enter the cave one after the other. Despite the skull, there's nothing to fear today. All the elephants are female. Some are pregnant. Others have brought along youngsters. They feel along the cave walls with their trunks in total darkness. The elephant in the front begins scraping at the ceiling with her tusks, loosening the salt from the walls and collecting the mineral-rich deposits in her mouth. Salt is an essential part of their diet, and they vacuum the rock walls for every last grain. Then, at one o'clock in the morning, as if on cue, the elephants leave the cave in formation. The route into the cave and the technique of scraping the walls have been passed from generation to generation for centuries. It's a tradition that exists only here on Mount Elgin. After almost 24 hours on the road, the caravan of giraffes has finally reached the shore of the Nile River in Uganda. Arthur keeps a close eye on his charges as the driver carefully pulls the carrier onto a barge, which will ferry them across the river. The giraffes appear calm, cool, and collected, despite the bumpy ride. They're about to get a waterfront view unlike anything they've ever seen before. Safe on board the barge, the makeshift arc begins the crossing. Far above the dangers in the river below. It'll take about an hour to reach the other shore, but it'll be well worth it. In their new home, the giraffes will be safe from man-made threats, and by mating with local animals, they'll increase the herd's genetic diversity and health. The southern side of Murchison is going to start having a giraffe population as other large mammals start to come back, like the elephants and other species. So we're really pleased about that. Almost 250 kilometers to the south, also near the Nile, in Kabali Forest National Park, a young animal is in danger. A tiny orphan chimpanzee awaits his fate. Here in Kabali National Park, a large untouched area of rainforest, a baby chimp has gotten a rough start in life. He lost his mother far too early. But things started looking up when the large male on the left, known as Brownface, saw that he needed a friend. Brownface did something very unusual. He adopted the little guy and raised him as a single dad. It is not common for male chimps to adopt baby chimps and raise them because chimpanzees grow up in a family where they have a mother and one or two children. It's extremely rare for a male chimp to look after an infant. In Brownface's capable hands, Junior has grown much stronger. He's mastering the skills to escape life's perils. Brownface has proved to be a very good parent. These chimps are among Kabali's most famous inhabitants, and they're thriving. The chimpanzee numbers have gone up, which we're really pleased about. In 1997, there were about 3,300 chimpanzees in the country, and now the numbers have gone up to about 5,000. These particular chimpanzees live in the Ngogo region of the park. 
This group has about 200 members, making it the largest ever observed. In 25 years of study, scientists have learned a lot about the group. Mutual grooming improves social relations and tells the scientists which chimpanzees are buddies. Junior is learning basic skills, like how to make his own bed, since chimpanzees build nests like this to sleep in at night. They can also pull double duty and be used for an afternoon nap. Junior is also finding his way around these giant fig trees, one of Ingogo's riches. Known as Ficus mucoso, they may be the reason for the large numbers of chimps and their health. The chimps are happiest in the tops of the large fig trees, where they both mate and sleep. Unlike some other areas, fruit and nuts are available in Ingogo year-round. They're helping make Junior a strapping young chimp. The abundance of food may also explain the exceptional size of this group. Biologists have established that the group's members are very healthy. The average age of the animals is 33, while nearby groups have an average age of just 20. A group of males rests on the ground. Coalitions like this are often maintained over years, sometimes even over a lifetime. And in Ingogo, females establish similar alliances. Chimpanzees form these cliques to hunt and to help each other gain status. But all work together to aggressively expand the group's territory. They frequently drive neighbors from their fruit trees and out of the area. In Murchison Falls National Park, the six giraffes have finally reached the south shore of the Nile River. Despite a very long journey, they're safe and sound on the other side. At the release site, Arthur lends a hand to help set up a chute to guide the giraffe safely off the carrier. Let us pull. But with the trailer door open, the giraffes aren't quite sure what to do. Come on, Melman. Don't disappoint. Until Melman takes the lead. Almost... There you go. Ooh. All six out. It was good helping the giraffe find a new home. So it's a great opportunity to see them run away and just being free. Yeah, six giraffes up and running, up on the release, that was good. Everything went well. It's been an emotional day. <laughs> Wild Uganda's national parks are jewels in Africa's verdant treasury. But they do hold perils for giraffes like Melman and his tower, lions like Brenda and Butcherman, and orphans like Junior. Only with a little help from their friends can it also be a paradise, a sanctuary of wild beauty they can safely call home.